So um, I am delighted to welcome our keynote speaker, um, Dr. Benjamin Kurtman uh, is here with us from Florida. Um, he'll give a presentation and there is, a, there is time for Q&A, so please write your questions and comments in your little Peace and Conflict Studies journals and save them for when he is ready to take them. Professor Benjamin Kurtman received his uh, BS in Applied Mathematics from the University of California, San Diego in 1987, and his MS and PhD in 1992 from the University of Maryland College Park. He's a full professor of atmospheric sciences, director of the Cooperative Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Studies, and serves as deputy director for the Institute for Data Science and Computing at the University of Miami Rosenthal School of Marine, Atmospheric, and Earth Sciences. Internationally, his work has enjoyed uh, a leadership role in the World Climate Research Program, seasonal to interannual prediction activities. In particular, he has chaired the International Clever Working Group on Seasonal to Interannual Prediction and the WCRP Task Force for Seasonal Prediction. Dr. Kurtman was a coordinating lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group, um, the scientific basis of it. Dr. Kurtman. I think we need to change the view here. There we go. Okay, thank you for the introduction and uh, really thanks for the opportunity to uh, be here. Um, uh, among my many character flaws, I'm gonna tell you a couple that are relevant for this presentation. The first is, for the life of me, I cannot stand still. So I'm going to wander around. The IT guys have asked me to wander primarily on this side <laughs> because that uh, speaker works, but that one doesn't. It's gone. So I'm going to try to be good and wander on this side, but um, I'm really am a wanderer. The uh, other uh, major character flaw is I'm uh, very much a traditional academic, and if you wind me up and turn me on, I'll talk your ear off, and I can go on forever. And so I really want to urge the conference organizers and whoever's keeping time to tell me to stop when it's time to stop. Uh, the other thing is, as the audience, the more you interrupt me, I, yes, I'll take questions at the end, of course, but the more you want to interrupt me, the more this is a dialogue, uh, the much more fun it is for me, and I think it'd be much more fun for you too. So please don't hesitate to pop your hand up in the air, ask a question, I'll repeat it, and we can, we can discuss it. Uh, third character flaw. There's a lot of character flaws. This is merely a subsample. The third character flaw is I'm a storyteller. I tell lots of stories. And so I want to start out a little bit of telling you a story about how I got interested in this business, if you will, uh, in this work, as Deborah talks about, it's a passion, um, because I think it, it sort of reflects uh, how I've come, uh, uh, my journey in a way that really uh, has evolved uh, in, an in what I think is an interesting way. So uh, I got interested in applied mathematics um, primarily because I felt that dealing with humans was too difficult. And so mathematics, it's a bunch of equations, a bunch of numbers. I can just play with those, and I could be quite happy. But uh, I wanted to save the world, right? I mean, what young person doesn't want to save the world? And so I got very interested in the notion of uh, using mathematics to predict hazards, environmental hazards, floods, droughts, wildfires, 
hurricanes, tornadoes, those kinds of things. Uh, and uh, so that's how I got started. But as I did that work, uh, I was heavily involved in prediction, as the nice introduction mentioned. So a lot of prediction work. You know, can I, can I predict what the climate system is going to look like three weeks from today, four weeks from today? Can I tell you that we're going to enter a period of time that there's a greater chance of hurricanes? Can I tell you, a, you know, next winter is going to be a rainy, wet, cold winter? Can I tell you five years from now you can expect more, more flooding or more drought in the West? Whatever it is, can, you, can I tell you something about those hazards? And I learned very quickly, and this is where I think things have transformed and is much more relevant to this question of climate science and climate justice, is a forecast is useless, absolutely useless, if someone doesn't use it to make a decision. It has no intrinsic value until someone uses it to make a decision. So darn it, I have to work with humans, right? <laughs> Humans are the people, <laughs> those are the things that are making decisions. And so uh, when I start to think about how uh, my, my own research has evolved, I have to keep in mind that what we're doing has to, you know, for it to have real value, it has to inform decisions. That's really hard, much, much harder than the geophysical fluid dynamics that I do at my desk and in the computer, much harder. So uh, that's part of my evolution, and uh, hopefully that'll start to appear as we, as we progress. So just to give you an idea of what I want to talk about, is I want to talk about some of the basics, the current state of the climate system. What do we know about uh, what the climate system looks like today? And it's a little bit of a backward looking, right? It's a little bit looking back in time, how do we get to the present uh, uh, one way I like to think about this is when you have that argument with Uncle Bob at Thanksgiving or Aunt Bobby at Thanksgiving about whether the climate, you know, climate change is real, I'm here to help you with some ammunition. Okay? I want to give you some ammunition. Uh, a really uh, quirky thing about this uh, intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change, um, a really quirky thing is how those projections of the future are made. And uh, one thing I learned getting involved in this process back in 2007, I started working with the IPCC, is that they're not meant to be predictions of the future. And so it takes a little while to get your head around that. They're what ifs, they're trying to bracket uh, what the possible futures are so we can, as humans, make decisions about how we want to evolve. Okay? And that, that's not how guys like me interpret them. And that disconnect has profound implications, and I want to chat about that a little bit. So this is under, understanding under this umbrella of understanding scenarios, predictions versus projections. It sounds like, you know, uh, inside baseball. But it's really, really important when you think about how uh, governments, communities, state governments, federal governments, local governments are going to have to make decisions. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about uh, future, well, I've already covered that. Then I want to talk a little bit about how the IPCC, this intergovernmental panel on climate change, has evolved, whoops, going on the wrong side there has evolved to really think about inequity issues and poverty issues. And one of the things that I learned in uh, uh, the environmental hazards prediction realm is that uh, if a community doesn't have the capacity to adapt, to respond to that hazard, then putting kinds of machinery in place and infrastructure, it's not gonna work. And that's a little bit true, or not a little bit, but even more true in climate change adaptation. If we put a lot of infrastructure in place, governmental policies and procedures, all that kind of stuff, if the community doesn't buy in, or doesn't have the capacity to buy in, it's not gonna work. 
In fact, it can be maladaptation. It can be really problematic. And so the process of adapting and mitigating climate change necessarily needs to include thinking about reducing inequity and reducing poverty. Those two things are critical in the adaptation process. And in fact, there's a big dividend. If you're successful in reducing poverty, that tends to produce more resources for better adaptation. Those are really important thoughts. So from a, an applied mathematician that went into it from not wanting to deal with mathematics, uh, not wanting to deal with people, you can see there's quite a transformation in the way I think about it. Um, the other thing we learned in this hazards prediction is the people that are making the decisions, they need to drive how the science is done. If I make a forecast that doesn't provide the information or a projection that doesn't provide the information they need to make a decision, they're not going to use it. And so there's this really important feedback in how we do our climate change science. It should be based on how people are making decisions so that affects how climate change science is done. That's not, you know, there's this um, uh, view of the world in climate science that I just make my prediction or my prediction and I throw it over the wall and everything is going to be good. People will take it up, pick it up. It's great science. Why aren't they using it? They're not using it because it doesn't meet what they need, information they need to make their decisions. And if I include their informational needs in how I design my experiments or how I design my analysis, then they become a trusted partner and they're going to use that information to make decisions. All of these things are, are critical. Um, and then, of course, uh, again, this, uh, and, and Jason talked a little bit about this in the, uh, the panel this morning, uh, community values, community values, it, uh, when you think about how we're going to adapt to climate change, community values really have to drive that. It has to be a big part of that problem. We can't just, again, throw the science on the, over the fence and hope that everything will work out well. You have to think about that science in terms of how does it fit with community values. Okay, so let's do, let's do some basic climate science first. Um, the first thing I'm showing you here is uh, some carbon dioxide concentrations from the last uh, two million years going all the way back. But I want to drill down to the ones in the, in the blue ovals, because this is, this is for Uncle Bob, okay? This is for Uncle Bob. And so I'm showing a little, hopefully, a little movie here. Ah, there we go. Here's my movie. This is showing you CO2 concentrations. We're going to start, we started in 1979. And along this, this axis here is just, you know, going across from the north to the south. And this is starting in January 1979, and we had 336 parts per million by volume. And then it just times going forward. And you can see there's lots of spikes here in the northern hemisphere, right? So that's because there's new stations coming out or uh, a lot more uh, uh, emissions. And so there are these little spikes. But the most important thing is, it's pretty flat when you go from north to south, right? This big blue dot here, that's all the way in Antarctica. There's no power plants in Antarctica. There's you know, virtually no humans. So there's not a lot of CO2 emissions. So this is a really important part of CO2 that it's a very well mixed gas in the atmosphere. So, it's a, so when you get in your car and you drive home tonight and you produce, you know, 100 molecules of CO2 that go into the atmosphere, it's going to affect, they're going to get distributed around the world very quickly. It affects everybody. And you can see the numbers going way up. We're going to start to go backwards in time now. And these curves, various uh, different kinds of proxy data sets. By the way, that 100 molecules that you uh, produce today when you drive home, the half-life of those, four, those 100 molecules is four thousand years. So what do I mean by that? It's going to take 2,000 years for those 100 molecules to reduce to 50. Okay? This is now going back uh, 
about uh, 800,000 year, uh, yeah, 800,000 years ago. Big ups and downs, big ups and downs, right? Huge, that's the, you know, changes in the orbital parameters of the Earth, right? Those big ups and downs. So one way to, one way to think about this, this is going back eight, the 800,000 years, that 418 numbers, I looked it up a few days ago, so that's pretty close to where we are today. The purpley curve, um, they both look purple to me, so the, the upper curve there is the CO2 concentrations and the bottom curve there is the temperature concentrations. So it's going back 800,000 years, they go up, to, up and down together, right? Up and down together. One way to you know, say, Uncle Bob, well, you know, the last 800,000 years, Bob, the CO2 has been somewhere between 200 and 300, easy numbers to remember, between 200 and 300 parts per million by volume, you know, over the last 800,000 years. And when it jumps from 200 to 300, it takes something like 10,000 to 30,000 years. 10 to 30,000 years, it takes a long time, right? We're at 418. When I started that curve, the earlier the movie, right, it started around 300, maybe 330, something like that in 1979, 330. So we went from, you know, 300 to 418 in less than 150 years. In the past, it's gone from 200 to 300, it took 10,000 years, okay? So, Bob, there's no question, Uncle Bob, we've introduced a lot more CO2 in the atmosphere. We're out of bounds. We're over 100 parts per million by volume out of bounds from where we've been over the last 800,000 years, okay? And, of course, temperature goes along with that. Okay, you're not allowed, it's illegal, to give a climate change talk without showing pictures of glaciers. <laughs> I'm just, just saying, it's illegal. Okay, so I love this picture, it's a nice picture. This is showing the Muir Glacier in Alaska. This photograph was taken in 1949. This photograph was taken in 2004. And there, it's an attempt, a real, a real earnest attempt to try to line those two photographs up, right? And, you can see this is the, this is the glacier line from the, uh, from 20, you know, from the early 1900s. That's the glacier line. The profound retreat in that Muir Glacier. Now, <clears throat> one thing you could say to me is, well, that's not a big deal, right? Glaciers come and glaciers go, right? Some retreat and some grow. And I, it kind of looks like art. And uh, I agree. Gla glaciers come and glaciers grow. Uh, if everything were cool, no pun intended, if, <laughs> if everything were cool, the number of glaciers around the world that were growing and the number of glaciers around the world that were retreating would be about the same. 50% growing, 50% retreating. That, that would be a climate system in balance. This is a each one of those goofy lines there is the front, the leading edge of one of the world's glaciers, okay? And we, zero, you know, we centered everything on 1960. I could have picked a different year, that's irrelevant. But what it's showing you is that most, before 1960, most of the world's glaciers were actually growing, going backwards in time. Most of them were growing, right? Compared to 1960, which is to be expected if most of the glaciers are now retreating. So this is going forward up to 2020. This is the extent of the world's glaciers. And what it says is that 98%, 98% of the world's glaciers are retreating. 98%. If everything were cool, it'd be 50-50. That's a climate system that's not in balance. My wife says I'm no fun at parties. But uh, I'm also extremely optimistic, right? Despite all this bad news I'm going to be giving you today, I am extremely optimistic. Part of my optimism is you guys being here today, that there's really a hope for the future, and we have a lot of work to do. But I am extremely optimistic, even though I'm no fun at parties. This plot, very simple plot, but a very interesting plot, this is showing you uh, Arctic, sea, Arctic ice and Greenland ice. That's not in those 
uh, glacier curves. Uh, whereas, you know, Greenland and Antarctica are, are massive glaciers, they're, they're ice on land. Ice on land, of course, uh, when you think about sea level rise, it's ice on land that's so important. If the ice is in the ocean, uh, if it's melting, that says the ocean's warm. That's not a good thing, but we don't care about that from a sea level rise perspective. It's ice that's on land that's melting and going into the ocean and adding mass. That's what we're worried about. So these are, these are two very important glaciers, so they're separate. Uh, and you can see this is the, this is the trend in uh, the ice mass since the uh, early 1990s. One of the interesting things is the red one, the Antarctic ice. When I s started working in the IPCC process, that our Antarctic sea ice was the holdout for those that were doubting that the climate system was changing, that we were warming. That was the holdout piece of data. Because if you, look, if you just look at that curve up to 2005, it really doesn't look like there's much of a trend. Not much of a trend. More recently, of course, there's a big trend in Antarctic ice. Okay? And you hear about it a lot in the news. People are talking about the Thwaites ice shelf collapsing. You hear it a lot in the news. Antarctic ice is really starting to uh, accelerate in its, in its uh, retreat. That's kind of interesting. Um, Greenland, if Greenland melted, all of Greenland, and this is, this is the precise moment that I don't get invited to parties anymore. If all of Greenland melted, that would be 27 meters of sea level rise globally. Everywhere. Everywhere. Globally. If Antarctica melted, that would be 54 meters of sea level everywhere. Yes, sir. What accounts for the growing drift of the bands? Oh, those are, oh, those are just uh, uncertainty estimates. So whenever you collect data, uh, a good scientific practice is to include uncertainty estimates. Um, sorry. If there are questions, if you could raise your hand, just for the integrity of the recording, if we don't hold a mic to your question, it won't be captured. And I'll try to repeat them if we don't get That would be helpful. So he was asking why the bands, and the reason the bands are is those are uncertainty estimates. These are, you know, these are, uh, data collection is imperfect, and so we always want to include estimates of what the uncertainties are. And it's, it's growing because of data, uh, uh, the, he's asking why it's getting wider and wider. Uh, yes, it is uh, because as you have less and less ice, um, our estimates of where that ice melt is coming are getting worse and worse. Uh, the last... Excuse me, one, quick, one question. Uh, I know this is rather simplistic, um, so I'll give you some error bounds on this. Um, what is the reason for the major uh, acceleration after 2005? Or what are the top couple of reasons? Um, I don't know if we have a really good answer for that. Uh, most, if you just consider the area over Antarctica where the ice is growing, right, it's a vast area where ice is growing. The region where ice is retreating in Antarctica is a narrow, is a narrow region. It's pretty small. And um, it's that narrow region that's starting to really, really retreat rapidly. And that's what's overtaken the sort of ubiquitous growth elsewhere. It has to do with the geometric configuration? It has to do with the geometric, exactly. And it has to do with ocean. And it has to do with ocean circulation around it and all kinds of complexities and is the grounding edge uh, uh, decaying rapidly, how much ice is get, how much water is getting in underneath the ice and where that's happening, and that's being driven by the geometry. Uh, the last decade is the warmest decade in the last 125,000 years. That's quite quite dramatic. These are showing you long temperature records. I'm going to drill down onto these a little bit. Uh, this is looking over the, what we refer to as the modern, the modern instrument record uh, temperatures. 
and um, there's a whole bunch of uh, different curves on there. Those are different estimates of temperature. One of those curves is kind of a nice, interesting story. One of those curves on there is from this project called Berkeley Earth. And when I was working on the IPCC process, these guys at um, uh, the University of California, Berkeley, a physicist, he said, oh, you climate guys, you don't know how to analyze data. You're doing it wrong. You're doing it all wrong. And so uh, it captured the imagination of uh, uh, some rich donors that wanted to uh, demonstrate that the climate system isn't warming. Um, and so they started this thing called Berkeley Earth. They donated to this guy. I can't remember his name. And this was all happening while we were working on the IPCC report. And then he redid his analysis. It's one of those curves. Not very different from the curves we produce. Uh, so I think those donors were kind of disappointed in their philanthropy, their philanthropy. Uh, today, the guy that runs Berkeley Earth is one of the most, you know what they say about converts, right? One of the most vocal advocates for climate change, that it's real. And he's been, actually, he's been doing some things that I, I, I kind of make me feel a little bit uncomfortable, some claims. But, uh, and what you can see is there, we keep, we keep breaking these critical uh, uh, crossroads. And if you remember the Paris Accords, when the Paris Accords were going on, the climate science community was arguing for two degrees. We can handle two degrees. Uh, but a large number of um, uh, island states in particular, but other countries too, but a large number of island states said they're not going to make it at two degrees, with two degrees of warming. We need to shoot for a one and a half degrees of warming. We, uh, we're already at 1.26 degrees of warming. Uh, just to show you a picture, uh, a more recent picture, this actually doesn't go very far, it only goes to 2021. Uh, and you always have to be careful about what's your baseline, what are you comparing against, and, and, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, this is the notion, you've probably heard about it, the Arctic amplification. The, uh, the far northern hemisphere tends to warm much faster than anywhere else on the globe. Oops, didn't mean to go that fast. Okay. So uh, one of the things in Miami that we worry about a lot, and my, my research group we do a lot of work on, is uh, sea level rise. And so if you look at this uh, top picture right here, this is showing you the sea level in the last 800,000 years. That goes with that temperature and CO2 plot. And in fact, all of these ups and downs line up with the temperature and the CO2, and it kind of makes sense, right? Uh, they line up with that very nicely. And then this, uh, this is probably the more important plot. This is showing you sea level, and, and people always ask me, well, how do you go back 2,500 years to estimate sea level? We, we drill into corals. We take coral samples um, uh, uh, to estimate sea level in the past. And you date those coral samples, and you can estimate where the sea level was. Uh, anyways, this is sea level, or estimates of sea level going back um, uh, 2,500 years. And what you see, there's, of course, there's natural variability. Sea level goes up and down. It's to be expected. You know, the glaciers aren't in perfect equilibrium. Some are melting, some are growing, sometimes a little more melt. And, than growth and, you know, up and down. The, the important point of this picture is the rate of change. How fast does it change? You look over the past, it's kind of smooth, gradual. But when you come up to the present here, right, during the satellite era, starting in 1990s or so, very rapid growth in sea level, very rapid growth. So the rate of change of sea level is unprecedented in the last uh, 3,000 years or so. Uh, and uh, this is an important uh, part, is the red curve here, this is showing the sea level from satellite estimates. The, uh, the black curve is the global mean sea level, and then the blue curve is the rise in sea level from all that melting ice. Just the contribution, so just that, that ice on land, its mass is going into the ocean. And then the red curve, is the sea level rise that's due to 
you know, uh, this matches your own personal experience. With, you know, you warm up the gas, it takes up more volume. The same thing is true with the ocean. You warm up the ocean, it takes up more volume. It's a thermal expansion. Oops. Oh, I, I already told you all that bad news. Um, Arctic, uh, Arctic ice is, uh, is another, uh, ice is really kind of the canary in the coal mine in this story. Kind of the canary in the coal mine. And uh, Arctic ice is, is really uh, interesting. Uh, in the Antarctic, it's um, an, an inverted keyhole. There's a big continent, right? And the sea ice is all around the continent. And that sea ice comes and goes every season. You know, in the winter, there's a bunch of sea ice. In the summer, there's no sea ice. Very seasonal. The Arctic is a keyhole. It's just the reverse, right? The continents are all around it, and the ocean is sort of isolated. So the sea ice in the Arctic is really, really old. It can be, you know, there can be chunks of ice there that are thousands of years old, very old ice. And so uh, when it's showing a downward trend, a downward trend in the amount of ice in the Arctic, that's kind of a canary in the coal mine. And what this, what this curve is showing you is this is sort of what our estimates of ice had been with uncertainty estimates from 1981 through, say, 2010. And then these are some of the more recent years. They're out of bounds from what it's been in the past. And that's really old ice. Think about the, if the Arctic has a, becomes ice-free in the summer, which, just one second, I'll get to you, becomes free in the summer, it might happen in, say, um, 2040, 2050. Think about the geopolitical ramifications in terms of uh, trying to uh, exploit natural resources, uh, the conflicts, uh, and we expect there to be an Arctic ice-free, you know, by the mid-century. So basically, since we are going down a trend of uh, affecting the climate at this moment. Uh, if we change our behavior and try to help the environment mo as much as possible, uh, do you believe that it would have a really impactful change at the, in the short term, or do we still going to face some of the effects regardless? It's a fabulous question. You're, you're never going to want to invite me over. <laughs> so. So I mentioned this half-life of CO2, um, this 4,000-year uh, half-life. Uh, if we stopped, if we zeroed emissions today, we completely stopped CO2 emissions and methane emissions, by the way. If we stopped greenhouse gas emissions today, we would be in for at least 30 to 40 more years of warming, at least. So uh, the need to think about uh, negative emissions is real. The need to think about negative emissions is real. OK. So Uncle Bob and Aunt Betty, you've convinced them the climate is changing. You've convinced them that CO2 is increasing, right? Both of those things are happening. But they're still, no, nah, just don't buy it. What's the causal? You know, where's the causal part? Where can you really show me that, it's, that it really is the CO2? How do I know? How do I know? And so there's a couple of ways we know, and I'm just going to show you the first one, and then I'll show you the second one in a little bit. And the second one is the kind of the area that I work in. Uh, this is showing you that uh, temperature record, global mean temperature records, a bunch of different records, uh, the change relative to some period. We can doing some clever data analysis, we can decompose, we can decompose that temperature record uh, into things we know, we know about. You guys have all, you've all heard about El Nino, right? Of course. So we can, we can talk about those fluctuations that are due to El Nino. That's the second curve. We can talk about the fluctuations in temperature that are due to volcanoes. Volcanoes, right, when, they, when a volcano blows, it produces a bunch of sulfate aerosols that go way up into the atmosphere. They go into the stratosphere, and they can stay up there for months, if not years, a couple of years. And that cools the climate system. So you've heard, you've heard this notion, people talking about geoengineering, 
they're thinking about. One of the things people are thinking about is injecting sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere to cool the climate. Because those sulfate aerosols reflect sunlight back to space. Might make your life on Earth a little dreary, but it might stop the warming. That's a, something that's going to happen. The, uh, so those are volcanoes, and that's why there's cooling. And then, then there's the sun. And my dad used to teach me, he's a firm believer in, in climate change, but he used to tease me all the time, and he would say, oh, it's the sun, stupid. See the pun? It's the sun, stupid. Right, okay. So, uh, so the, that other curve is just the solar variations. And then there's a bunch of other stuff uh, that's very interesting. This one is particularly interesting for sea level rise, but not really for global temperatures. And the only thing left... The only thing left is the one that produces the trend, and that's CO2. That's the only thing left, and, and methane. That's anthropogenic climate change. So we'll come back and talk more about it. All right, so let's see. How do we... Okay, so this is looking backwards in time. We looked over the modern instrument record. We looked over, over, over the paleo record, these proxy records. Now, how do, we, how do we talk about the future? And in fact, one of our, uh, one of our panelists there was showing this uh, for Austin. Is, and I, I, I wanted to uh, ask him about this. He was showing this Atlas 14 about flood risk in, in Austin, Texas, right? That's a very backward, I know that report. I know that report intimately. Uh, it's not, I don't, I uh, apologize for using the word backward. It's backward looking been time. It's not backwards. You know, it's, it's backward looking in time. It looks at historical data. It doesn't look at the future. It doesn't use anything to estimate the future other than what trends have happened in the past. I think that's a big problem. In fact, we're trying to push for uh, the federal government to fund us. We've proposed, and we're hoping they're going to do that, to develop a better Atlas 14 which would actually use some of these methodologies that I'm going to talk about now, about how to think about what the future climate would look like that's not backward-looking, but forward-looking. Okay. Oops. Uh, okay. So here's this uh, uh, incredibly difficult to look at picture, and there's a, a couple of things uh, here that are, are, are really important. I want to talk a little bit about concentrations versus emissions. There's a lot of confusion about that. Those things are very different, very different. And with carbon dioxide, it's really important because we know there's this 4,000-year half-life. So even if emissions go to zero, we don't, we don't draw down half the carbon we've emitted. We don't get from 400 parts per million by volume to 200 for 2,000 more years if there's no emissions. So that's a big deal. Okay. So we want to be clear about the difference between emissions and, and um, concentrations. And then there's this notion of socioeconomic pathways, SSPs. This is really important. This is really important. And I want to dig into that a little bit. OK. So I'm going to cut this picture up a little bit to make it easier to think about. And so. Uh, this, let's just pick on this one for a moment. These are human activities that are contributing to changes in the chemical composition of the atmosphere. Okay? And this bottom set of panels is uh, for um, concentrations. And so the example that you see, you know, this uh, red curve where the concentrations are continuing to rise even though the emissions have plateaued. Right? So you don't see you don't see a reduction in concentrations when the emissions plateau right away. It takes a long time. The, uh, some of these other uh, scenarios, if you will, emission scenarios, actually include negative emissions, that we're actually going to do something to draw down the uh, carbon dioxide, some human activities. And I would argue that this, this uh, blue one in particular is uh, thinking about technology that doesn't exist today and probably won't exist for another 20 years. So that's the disconnect right there. As a climate scientist, the economists give me these scenarios and I pop them into my computer model and I march it forward in time as if it's a statement about 
the future of the planet Earth. But that's not what the economists mean. The economists mean it's a what if. What if we could draw down CO2? What would be the implications? They're thinking about it from a what if experiment as opposed to a prediction of the future. That creates, you know, it seems subtle, but it creates profound disconnects in how the, these projections are used. So locally, you know, local governments are trying to use the projections we make with our computer models to make decisions, and they're tempted to say, well, if this one's just as likely as the red one's up there, why don't I use that one? And you, they can't use that one because it's not gonna happen. It's a what if. And so it creates some profound problems. Okay. And so we have these very complicated computer models. We put these scenarios into our computer models and um, there's these uh, set of numbers here, SSP1, uh, 1.9, these numbers sound really strange, you know, whatever. The SSPs, I'm going to go through, these shared socioeconomic pathways, they're really important, particularly from the perspective of climate justice, particularly important, right? So I really want to go through those a little bit. The uh, numbers that follow after the dash, 1.9, 8.5, 7.0, that's what we think the, the radiative forcing that you're introducing to the system. So as a climate scientist, oh yeah, 8.5, it's 8 point watts per meter squared, that's going to give a certain amount of warming. You know, so it's a very technical term. But the SSPs are socioeconomic pathways. We put all this stuff into our models and we produce the implications of all these economic or integrated assessment community scenarios. And then they will put those, they can put those together to make assessments, you know, guided by their knowledge, assessments of what, what possible policies should be implemented. But that gets seriously disconnected because, you know, Austin Water may just look at the model output and think it's a prediction of what the future is going to be. So I apologize for all these words. Uh, but I'm going to dig into them a little bit more. But just look at the language that's associated with these socioeconomic pathways, right? There's a, there's a sea change in how climate scientists are thinking about things now, truly. Uh, SSP1, right? That's a, a future where, uh, uh, you know, inequality and poverty have been largely eradicated, right? Uh, SSP3, that's, in some, in some views of the world, that's, that's the worst. There's one, two, three, four, five. That's actually uh, three and four may be worse in that, you know, people are, uh, it's a pathway where there's uh, little, capacity to, uh, little capacity to adapt. Little capacity to adapt, even though the you know, the consumption is not out of control. Whereas SSP5, right, is much more emissions, but there's greater capacity to adapt. So you can see how these things, you know, can get really confusing if you use them as predictions as opposed to what-if experiments. Really important. So, and so this, I think, summarizes where uh, I think this, uh, there's so much work to be done. And there's a lot of room for optimism, but it's also uh, uh, just incredibly challenging. So, um, this is, you know, you can do it in, in a development context or a resilient context or a sustainability context, it doesn't matter. These are various emission pathways. In, uh, it's good we're getting away from what all those pathways are and just talking to start talking about what's the temperature, what's the global mean temperature, one and a half degrees, two degrees, four degrees, whatever it is. And then, then there's all of these uh, issues about sustainable development. Uh, you can imagine this SSP1 where the poverty is low and the inequality is low and 
uh, where the SSP5 would be there's lots of uh, regional rivalry and high poverty, for example. Okay? And then we're in the vast middle, of course. That's just the human existence. We're always in the vast middle. We never quite get where we need to be, and we're never as bad as we think we we're going, right? So we're in the vast middle. And the, the important thing about the vast middle is this uh, uh, dashed curve and this adaptation gap. This adaptation gap. And so if, we're, if we don't, the basic idea here is if we don't couple, if we don't couple inequality issues and poverty issues with adaptation issues at the same time, the adaptation issues will fail. That's that adaptation gap, right? So we might, from, a cli from my climate science perspective, we might be on a pretty good trajectory, two degrees of warming. Not so good for some of these island states, but, but not the worst, right? Might be able to stabilize the climate system at two degrees and then maybe get down to a lower level over time. Not so bad. But if we don't deal with our poverty and inequality issues, we still have, a, at two degrees, we have a major adaptation problem. And if we don't deal with those issues, that adaptation will fail. And there will be more unequal distribution of loss and damage. Okay. Yes, sir. Did you have a question? Yes. Go ahead. So a question that I hear a lot, like people bring up, it's uh, the transitioning for uh, more energy sufficient uh, fuels, going from fossil fuel to like eolic and uh, water-wise. They're saying that the transition is gonna create more uh, problems than actual like benefit on the process. I don't know if that would be a topic that's commonly brought up. Yeah, people, people ask me that all the time. So uh, we do uh, need to transition to much more electricity. I'll get to you, I promise. We do need to transition to a much, much more uh, electricity. Um, uh, and we need to really think very carefully how we're producing that electricity. Um, uh, I think the argument that it's going to create uh, more problems than it solves, I'm... I'm much more optimistic than that. I think we can do this right. In the US, uh, the transportation sector is our worst emitter of fossil fuels, transportation sector. And um, so the argument that I, I have, my father and I often argue climate science from a very positive perspective, but um, I, th I think we need to, uh, if we can't get on to all electric automobiles, uh, in the next 10 years, then uh, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Now, the electricity that's being used to, to generate the electricity for those automobiles, um, uh, we do have to really think very carefully where that electricity comes from, too. Those are two related issues. Think. Yes, sir. What would a nuclear war do to the uh, adaptation gap what would, what, I missed the first part. What would a nuclear war do to the gap? Um, wow. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't sound good to me. Um, I, I know that there was some work when I was starting out as a graduate student, there was some work on the, nuclear, the concept of nuclear winter, um, which would, people were trying to make the argument that a, uh, nuclear winter, which could very much be related to nuclear war, would um, um, uh, cool the planet. Um, um, I, I think I think the unintended consequences of advocating for that would probably be a lot worse. So, um, but I haven't thought very much about that. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, I have. I was going to go here. Oh, whatever. Okay. Yes, you guys are in charge. Uh, okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I just wanted to to reiterate. So your your argument, or you're supporting that 
if a community, I'm from San Antonio, so if community, and we have a climate action plan, but if that climate action plan does not include mitigation of community level poverty and inequality, that it's doomed to fail. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to be sure. I think that's very, very significant and very important. I work in the com you know, mm -hmm. low income communities of the public health nurse. And These I, things are too coupled. You cannot decouple you cannot, them. You cannot, yeah. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to be sure. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to get across. Yeah. And, and I think, by the way, it, it, the, uh, the poverty and inequality issues are not, uh, not just money, not just economics. Uh, well, the poverty part probably is. But community values have to be part of these adaptation plans. What, what are the priorities of that local community? have to be, it can't be that, uh, you know, someone swoops in from, uh, you know, the water management district and says, you know, you guys have to do this. The community has to buy in. There has to be trust. It's not going to work otherwise. It's just not going to work. So community values have to be a big part of that process. This is all coming from a guy who went into this business because he didn't want to deal with humans. I wonder, I wonder whether you've done any work with the En-ROADS climate simulator and whether it would be useful in helping communities choose their adaptation strategies. Uh, I haven't personally done that, but I do think it's very useful. And there's lots of others that um, uh, are really important. And that's, and that's the more forward-thinking approach as opposed to just using past trends. Uh, and I think... You know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, research and literature about how people make decisions in the face of risk and, uh, you know, uh, thinking about different scenarios and different emulators and all of that has to, has to become part of developing that community trust and, uh, to, in order to develop uh, good at adaptation policies. And, and that, that, there are some places where that's growing and happening, but I, I think the I want to emphasize the urgency that, that needs to start now. Oh, I'm, I'm wondering if you have an idea about uh, replacing all fossil fuel uh, use with, um, say, cyanobacteria making petroleum products. No. Out of my field of expertise. Sorry. So I have a oh gosh sorry I have a question because um, I mean, it's, I don't even know if it's even a full question it's more of a thought because you're talking about like poverty and equality and then getting the community to buy in and it sounds I just to me it just sounds expensive for me <laughs> um, any any changes that are going to happen and I just wonder. Um, because with the cost of living and the inflation and all that kind of stuff, m more and more I feel like I'm leaning towards poverty myself. Mm -hmm. And is the government sort of like waiting for us to like actually physically buy in? Are we going to like, are we going to have to just expect to like have to pay for, I don't know. It just seems like all that folds into like the majority of us having to like, expect extreme costs or, I don't know, what does that even look like? Um, that's an important part of the conversation. Um, people need to know what, what this is all going to mean and uh, for their own personal security and they need to have a clear understanding of what the risks are with inaction versus the costs of action. And uh, uh, that's the reality that we have to figure out how to deal with. I, I, I think um, uh, we should be leading, you know, this is my personal opinion, uh, obviously, it, it, we should be demand, you know, we should be leading our government to do the right thing. We shouldn't necessarily trust that, you know, they should be following us. It's our community leadership that be, should be driving the conversation. And, um, and, and if that's the case, then I, then I think we will come up with equitable uh, solutions to the problem and uh, start to bite off some of those enormously difficult 
inequality and poverty issues in the community. But if we, if we uh, don't seize uh, action, if we, you know, we're gonna, the cost of inaction, I think, is much worse. And people need to understand that very specifically. They, want, they need to know what that means for them at their house, in their apartment, in their daily life, in their job. They need to know what that cost of inaction is. And uh, you've seen these words buzz around. I, 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 didn't, I forgot to talk about it. The, it. There needs to be this very uh, hyper-local, hyper-local aspect to thinking about how we're going to deal with these problems. How does it affect me in my daily life and how I do things and how I work and how I make my living, my livelihood? And if, I don't, if we don't act, what are the implications for my livelihood, my daily life? And those are the things that we're not doing enough in terms of you know, having those conversations. That's how I think about an answer to your question. I know it's not adequate because you're, you're worrying about a big threat. But I think you need to have those conversations. We need to drive this. Um, so I completely agree that we need to start at a base, basically, because in order to worry about stuff like climate change and everything, we need to have a cool mind without uh, uh, not worrying what we're going to eat or where we're going to sleep. Uh, however, I think that a lot of it will be how and what can we do to actually impact the education systems um, to enforce and teach younger generations how to how important climate change is and how fast it's actually happening because mm -hmm. a lot of it uh, people brush it off as it's like oh it's not my problem it's going to happen in 300 years 400 years but it's already going on and probably in the next 50 years we're going to have like a a good trend of water level raising, and it's going to impact um, water coasts. So mm -hmm. I was wondering what could we do to help out the community? If well, I, I think um, we've heard some of those things earlier today. Uh, I think uh, you need to get involved with your local community. Um, we need to start... Uh, um, uh, uh, one of the things that I've been involved with are, are, are what are called, uh, we call them local charrettes. And that is how do, you, how do we envision what the, uh, the, this, this community would look like in the future? What are the challenges? What are the threats? Um, uh, what, what do we want our local government uh, and then to pass that on to higher governments? What, 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 what do we want them to, to help us with? Um, and we, we want to lead them. So I think you, you saw some from some really interesting local community organizers and a willingness, you know, from Austin Water to listen. And so um, that, uh, you know, I think we need to have organized efforts at uh, starting that dialogue of what's the path forward? What do we envision our community to look like 30 years from today? What do we want? And, and, and what are the threats to that vision? But, yeah. We have one more question. Certainly. I feel like people can learn this and we can evolve. My bigger concern is. Uh oh, here it comes. <laughs> is the system, the corporate system, the capitalist system that is inherently invested in things being the, invested in the status quo? Uh, you know, I, I can. Uh, I can understand that um, uh, skepticism, um, uh, but I also think uh, we can change the hearts and minds of the corporate world. So I'm optimistic right, that we can do this and uh, demand more help from them to get these things done. So yeah, I understand the skepticism, but um, if, uh, if we lead the way, they'll follow. Okay, I showed this. Uh, so this is what I do. I make this disgusting picture. That's the kind of work that I do. Um, this, uh, in part. Uh, so, ben? Yeah. Sorry. One more. Okay. Oh, now sure. Go is ahead. Is that okay? If I don't finish, I don't finish. So much the better, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, with the emphasis on local solutions and local citizen involvement, uh, you're not addressing the geopolitical 
milieu. You can have Austin Water doing everything right, but if uh, autocracy starts slinging around nukes in Europe or in the Middle East or elsewhere, Southeast Asia, uh, everything is broken, to quote Bob Dylan. Uh, so, you know, uh, aren't you ignoring uh, any uh, conscious reference to the geopolitical milieu? Uh, I think I think it's uh, uh, reasonable to uh, raise that critique. Um, uh, what I would say to push back is this IPCC process that we're involved with as a scientific community. That. Um, uh, Yes, there are uh, individual uh, governments that are unwilling to be fair uh, contributors to the process, but um, I think they're in trouble in the long run, and I think the worldview is going to move, uh, move them or their countries. So uh, I think the, this IPCC process is the counterexample to that and, and its potential for success. Okay, so... This plot here with all the color on it, those are based on climate models. And look at that fire hose of information that comes. There's 63 different models. So I have one, you know, all these global climate modelers have one. There's 63 different models there. And we run those models over the past, right? And we ask this question, do they produce something that looks like the past? And if they do, however you want to measure that, then can we take those same models based on those scenarios and make estimates of what the future would look like? So this is all of those models making estimates of the past. And what I want to show is this human influence on climate, I did that, that was done with just data, just past data. Now we're going to do that with these climate models. Because what's really cool about a climate model is you literally get to play God. I get to say, okay, no CO2 emissions, no volcanoes. It's a model. I can do whatever I want. And so these are simulations where uh, this bottom one is uh, a model and a cloud of, of models, uh, you know, the uncertainty estimates based on many models, uh, re trying to reproduce the observed trend. So all the drivers, all the, you know, human activities, volcanoes, changes in the sun, all of those things. And uh, the top panel is showing what the trajectory of the climate would have been if all the natural stuff had happened. We had volcanoes, that's natural, that's not human caused. Although I did have someone ask me that once. But volcanoes are natural. Uh, orbital changes, those very slow orbital changes. And then, of course, the sun, sun solar flares, you know, that could affect the climate. So all those other curves, all those natural drivers are not producing this warming trend, not producing this warming trend. And then down here, right, we have uh, all the human drivers. So aerosols, right, I mentioned volcanic aerosols. Just human existence, we produce a lot of sulfate aerosols. They reflect sunlight. You, you probably notice this when there's a sort of, you know, it feels like a polluted day, the sky's kind of white, right? That's the sulfate aerosols reflecting sunlight back to space. That cools the planet. And so you can see why there's a lot of cooling associated with uh, sulfate aerosols. There's a temptation, a legitimate temptation, to look at that as a solution to the uh, global warming problem. So these sort of geoengineering solutions, we should, we should be keeping a very close eye on those solutions. Because I think some of the unintended consequences could be quite severe. Uh, land cover. There's some good news. If you start, you know, you start producing a lot of green land cover, right, that's going to tend to cool the climate system. That's, that's good. Ozone is, tends to be a weak warmer of the climate system, but it's actually, uh, yeah, a restoration of ozone. Um, when there's less ozone, the climate is cooler, more ozone, so it's, a, it's actually reverse. And then the greenhouse gases, of course, is above the observed curve because it's these other things that offset that a little bit. And so that same notion that it's human, you know, that I said with the data, it's human activities, the models are telling us the same thing. That's the point there. 
So this is then the, the future. Project, using those same models, we think we can do this. Let's take a look at some projections of the future. So let's drill into uh, temperature, global mean temperatures. Okay? So the gray and the black, that's how the models have behaved over the past historical record. Okay? The black is the observed and the gray bars are all the models. And there's two axes on here. Uh, and if you're not an expert in, in converting Celsius to Fahrenheit, a good approximation is just to double it. So two degrees Celsius would be approximately four degrees Fahrenheit. Um, close enough, anyways. And uh, the two different axes are important because people get confused. Um, when we talk about stabilizing the climate um, at one and a half degrees, we're, we're really talking about relative to the distant past. The distant past. Okay? That's what we're talking about. So we're already quite close to that one and a half degrees. Right? So there's two different axes, different relative periods. The numbers on the side there are just uh, how many different models participated in those experiments. Not too important. And you can see they have different socioeconomic pathways. So this SSP3 7.0, right? That actually, uh, even though it's not necessarily showing the most warming, that actually may be the scenario that's the most unequal in terms of uh, human loss and damages. Because that's the socioeconomic pathway that is most confrontational, less, less uh, efforts to reduce poverty and inequality. Even though the actual warming is not as much, the adaptation doesn't work and human existence is not as uh, pleasant. Uh, changes in precipitation over land. And this is why uh, um, I, th I think the efforts that, you know, I, I feel bad about picking on Austin water, but j just as an exemplar, because it's true with water management in, in, in Miami also, if, if, you, if you only look backwards in time, some of the trends are very difficult to see because look at the error bars, right? They're huge. The gray is huge. So some of the trends, in, in particularly at an individual point, are very difficult to see in precipitation, you know. Uh, and so if you only look backwards, it's a bit of a challenge. When we start to look forwards using these models, then, then you might, you know, your, your building codes are based on the 100-year flood that you've added three inches to, but in five or 10 years, that may be meaningless. That may turn out to be the one in 10 year flood. And so maybe you need to think a little bit more in terms of what the projections are gonna be when you start to think about those things. That's what I would be urging. Remember I talked about the Arctic sea ice. Uh, so with some of these scenarios, uh, yeah, around 2050, the Arctic may be ice-free, practically ice-free in the summer. I, uh, I, I just think it's, you know, if I can be dispassionate, uh, uh, be very interesting to see what happens when the Arctic is ice-free. I think that's going to be a really interesting time. And what we worry about a lot in uh, Miami, of course, are these are the projections for sea level rise going into the future. Um, we've already seen a significant amount of sea level rise up to 1995, so these, this is relative to 1995, so, um, and this is global. Uh, the estimates are that, that um, where in Miami where, where I live, uh, that we're probably by the end of the century, we're gonna see a lot more than, than three feet. Probably a lot more than three feet. Uh, it's funny is because I, I give these climate change talks in Miami all the time and, and invariably people come up to me at the end of the talk and they tell me where they live and they, they ask me when should they sell their home. <laughs> huh. And uh, I, I, uh, I, I don't know, you know, my answer is always, well, what's your risk tolerance? And they look at me like I'm an idiot. Um, and then they ask me where I live and what, what elevation I'm at. And so I'm at around 17 feet, uh, which in Miami is like, you know, 
you're on the moon. It's that's you know most of Miami is below four feet. So um, people are like, wow, did you did you did you plan it that way? Did you think about it? And I have to confess, it was a total Forrest Gump. It just luck. Just it was the house we liked. <laughs> but Ben. I just wanted to give you a heads up. Oh, I'm out of time? Not yet. You have about like seven minutes. Seven minutes. I only have about 47 more slides. So (laughs) I I, I think we can do it, right? (laughs) Seven minutes. Okay. Uh, Well, if that's the case, I'm going to skip that one. Uh, This is is more challenging news, really very challenging problem. If, you know, I, I, I feel like uh, I, I hosted this uh, climate change meeting right after the, the report that I worked on uh, came out in uh, 2013, and um, we had a big audience from the, uh, the Caribbean island states uh, attend the conference, and they were really hammering us on how uh, and, and rightly so, and how important that 1.5 degree threshold would be uh, for them, that their estimates of life in the Caribbean are going to be really, really profoundly challenged at, at 2 degrees, that 1.5 is not, uh, a 2 is not where they need to be. This is, you know, that SSP 1 2.6, that's the optimistic one, a very optimistic one. That's one, it's not the one point, it's not the SSP 1, 1.9, it's the SSP, uh, SSP 1, 2.6. 2.6, I think there's a chance we can do that. There is a chance we can do that. And uh, when you look at all the trajectories from that 2.6, SSP 1, 2.6, most of them go past 1.5 degrees. Most of them go past 1.5. Uh, you have to always show a picture of ice sheets, right? I told you glaciers are, you know, required. So these are uh, ice sheet mass. Um, uh, this is uh, the ice sheets in the ice sheets in Greenland. The the loss is measured by the ele- changes in elevation. Uh, this is over the most recent period. This is the change in elevation. So the the good the good news is, not all of Greenland will melt by 2100. That is the good news. There's a little risk of that. But there is an awful lot of melting of Greenland by 2100. So I'll give you a little bit picture, better picture of what um, we think is going to happen to Greenland. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, sea level rise. Um, one of the things that I think has happened uh, that's very helpful is uh, it, in terms of temperature, instead of talking about how much um, uh, necessarily uh, CO2 concentrations, we're talking about crossing certain temperature thresholds. That same conversation is starting with sea level rise. So we're now talking about when are we going to cross the half a meter threshold. And so then these are all these various scenarios of when we think we're going to cross that uh, half a meter threshold, one meter. So it's important to sort of change the way we think about it because that's, this is more in line with how decision makers think about it as opposed to climate modelers. Uh, hurricanes, right? Yes. Everybody cares about hurricanes. Um, the, uh, so uh, these are simulations of a pretty good model of uh, hurricane density. And uh, this is, uh, uh, based on one of these scenarios, what we think the hurricane density would look like at the end of the century in one of these climate change simulations. And you have to look at it for a little while, but maybe you'll trust me on it. Um, the number of storms, if you, look, if you drill down in the Atlantic, you see it more clearly. The number of category four and five storms spikes, right? So it's not that the total number of storms necessarily changes it's that the number of more extreme storms changes. In fact, the total number of storms may actually go down. Uh, Okay. 
We've talked a lot about this already. I'm skipping a lot because you know, I'm probably down to three minutes at this point. So um, we've talked a lot about these things, so I'm probably not going to show too much. Um, let's see, what's a good one? I, I do want to show this one. Uh, this is showing you in colors the number of days where it exceeds 35 degrees Celsius. The temperature exceeds 35 degrees Celsius. The little panel in the upper left is the globe. globe. And these uh, white, purple, blue, gray, half circles and circles, that's the number of refugee or displaced persons camps. So imagine, imagine you're in a refugee camp where the number of days that exceeds uh, um, uh, 35 degrees is over 100, and you're living in a tent in a refugee camp. The challenge to humanity is uh, tremendous, tremendous there. A lot more, a lot more thinking about um, uh, uh, and globally, a lot more thinking about uh, vulnerability. Now, the problem I have and maybe this will be one of the last, last couple of slides I show. The problem with vulnerability in this global context, in this global context, it's far too influenced by economic vulnerability. Far too influenced by economic vulnerability. Um, there needs to be many other things considered. So a lot of these vulnerability index indices that you see uh, and the colors are showing you the relative vulnerability. It's all about, it's all about economic vulnerability. And I, one thing I've tried, yes, that's really important. Poverty is a major issue. But inequality as part of that cannot be ignored. And uh, so working towards a, a future, and this is what we're trying to develop with partnerships with the federal government. And you can think about this quadrant if you read it. The IPCC process, the climate change community, the guys like me, we're in this upper, upper left-hand side here. We're running our models. We throw it over the fence. We hope people use it. They don't. Got news for you. They don't. Where we need to be is we, we need to have the climate modelers uh, or the people that, not necessarily monitors, but people that understand the climate, to work with the people that have to make decisions, to influence how the climate science is done, how the knowledge creation happens, right? And it needs to be done at a hyper-local scale. One of the key points. And I think that's going to happen. Uh, we've proposed it to NOAA, and I think they're going to fund it. I hope. Fingers crossed. Um, I think it's going to happen whether we do it at the University of Miami or somebody else does it. It's going to happen. I think that's an enormous opportunity to affect the world we're in. But I also think, for you young people that are really interested in participating, that there's an enormous jobs opportunity here to actually to work on this problem to save our futures. Uh, I always have to show a picture from my hometown. I grew up in Santa Barbara, California. Uh, it was very difficult growing up in paradise. I'm not going to show you what happens at 2300. So, final, a couple of final points. A question I always get, what's going on with emissions today? I get that question all the time. Emissions continue to grow. The rate of growth of emissions has gone down. We saw, we saw a real drop during COVID. People weren't driving as much, traveling as much, so there was a real drop. Uh, we recovered from that. We're, emit, we're emitting at the same pace now that we were before, not more. But the rate of growth of emissions is declining. That's good news. Uh, we talked about the, even if emissions went to zero, what a challenge that would be. Um, this third bullet uh, seems kind of subtle and unimportant. This is probably the, one of the most important points. We need to decouple emissions from GDP. And some countries have done that. Right? We don't want you know, economic prosperity to demand increased emissions. We need to make sure we decouple those things. 
And that's, that's some hard thinking that has to happen. Some countries have succeeded already, so there are exemplars out there. We need to do a lot better. Uh, my wife said to mix up the good news and the bad news a little bit. Uh, I don't think I did a very good job. Uh, at, the, at the current rate of emissions, the current rate, when are we going to, you know, when are we going to run out of carbon that we can produce, uh, put into the atmosphere and, uh, you know, stay below 1.5 degrees? We're going to run out of carbon in seven years. That's how much carbon we have left before we cross that threshold. Uh, uh, close to half the world's population lives in uh, regions that are viewed as highly vulnerable. Uh, I've made this point over and over again, and I think you guys have joined me in on that. Mitigation and adaptation strategies must, must consider poverty reduction and must rec recognize structural inequality issues. Uh, and I've also, I think, hammered this uh, hyper-local view of the world and, and, and including community values in, in uh, adaptation. Last slide, I promise. And uh, this is a nice cartoon, uh, pathway not taken. I think that pathway not taken is really um, during the Carter administration. I think that's back when we could have taken that path. Um, uh, this is where we are at present. We're very, very close to an important crossroads. You can see that, you know, the green and red little signs there. We're at that critical crossroad. We take the path to the north versus the path to the south. Uh, very different uh, outcomes. So we're, I'm optimistic we can do the right path, but I think it's tricky. We have a lot of work to do. And I'll stop there. Thank you.